from Atlisco, Puebla in Mexico. Welcome to the GCN show. Welcome to the GCN show brought to you by Wiggle. This week, nature versus nurture. Are cycling's biggest stars born or are they made? We've also got a brand new cycling speed record, some incredible stats about Matthew van der Poel and our first ever GCN inspiration videos, which is so good, we might be out of a job. Yeah. This week in the world of cycling, we learned that Neil Campbell is now officially the fastest man on two wheels. Yeah, move over Dylan Gronewegen, because this is Campbell on his way to hitting a mind-boggling 174 miles per hour and 280 kilometers per hour. And more on that in Cycling Shorts. Brilliant stuff. Uh, we also learned this week, or reminded at least, what it's like to ride a bike for the very first time. This is Jess, friend of Eleanor Barker, pro rider, who captured Jess riding a bike for the very first time and her subsequent reaction. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so. Ready? Oh. 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 How you feeling? I feel like I flew for about five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. <laughs> oh my God. I have to say, we love this video because yeah. I think it reminds us how it felt to ride a bike for the very first time, no matter what your age is. Yeah, that was quite the reaction, wasn't it? And tells you all you need to know about how good cycling yeah, is. Yeah, agreed. Uh, finally, this week, we learned that Matthew van der Poel is out of this world. Admittedly, we had a slight inkling to that effect a little while ago, uh, but we were reminded of this, in fact I reminded you of this, on the GCN Racing News Show yesterday, which you can now find on our GCN Racing channel. Uh, some stats from his season that came on Twitter from Jonas Kretur. So are you ready for this? I'm ready. He has competed in 12 cyclocross races this year, and he's won 12, a 100% record. He has competed in 16 mountain bike events, he's won 14, an 87.5% record. And then on the road, he's competed in 16 races and won seven, which is a 47.5% record. Overall, he's won 33 out of the 44 races he started, which is a 75% hit rate. I mean, very, very different to what our results look like. Yeah, slightly. Yeah. But I can understand on the off-road because if you're the best, I mean, you are the best. Uh, but on the roads, I mean, there's so many variables. Yeah. Anything can happen. It's almost a lottery. So to win seven out of the 16 races he's done is quite frankly, well, frightening. Now, admittedly, those stats are no longer quite as impressive because he failed to win any more stages of the Arctic mm. Race of Norway, so he's now won seven out of the 19 road races that he started. But nevertheless, those numbers did start us thinking, how much of cycling performance is nature and how much is nurture? Because Matthew van der Poel is a case in point when it comes to good genes, really, isn't it? Mm. His father, Adri, was a world cyclocross champion himself. He also won the Tour of Flanders, liege bastogne liege Amstel Gold Race, and a couple of stages of the Tour de France. And his granddad was Raymond Pouladour. He was known for the eternal second, which is slightly unfair, but he did come second in three editions of the Tour. But he won the Vuelta, he won Milan San Remo, he won seven stages of the Tour de France, and he won the Dauphiné, not once, but twice. So he was one of, well, the greatest cyclists of his generation. Slightly unfair nickname, really, yeah, when you consider how much he actually <laughs> did win. Uh, so there's no doubt that Van der Poel was always going places, and he did actually from a very young age. By the end of the junior category, he'd won the World Cyclocross Championships twice and the World Road Race Championships once. And the rest, as they say, is history. Except, unfortunately for the current pro riders, it's not actually history, is it? Because he seems to be just getting going. No, but there are some current examples. I mean, Remco Evenepoel, he's already won some of the world's biggest races. And I mean, he's only been cycling for just over two years. I know. And I mean, he must have put some hard work in, but well, how much hard work can you put in in two years? That is a very good point. And also, his dad was a former pro cyclist too. Then we've got more current examples, the likes of Egan Bernal, who's just won the Tour de France at 22 years of age, and in fact is the youngest winner of that race since the yellow jersey was introduced. And then Primoz Roglic, whose rise to the top of cycling has been almost quick as his fall to the bottom of a ski jump was a few years ago. Yeah, and then there's Fiona Kolbinger, who at just 24 has done her first race. I mean, it was the brutal transcontinental race, and she didn't just take part, she went and won the whole thing. But then 
if we look at it, I mean, have we seen any riders that have shown a glimpse of greatness in their early years, but then it's taken them years and years of practice to get to the top of their sport? We started talking about Geraint Thomas, didn't we? Mm. Because he was 32 by the time he won the Tour de France and hadn't really shown any signs that he was capable of that before he actually did it. But then he's not a great example from another respect because he was supremely talented and got massive results on the track from a very young age. Yeah, he did. I mean, the prime example, or the most obvious one, is Chris Froome. He did show some greatness in his early years, but it wasn't until he was 26 where he really showed what he could do at the Vuelta in 2011, where he came second, but now is declared the winner of that race. That's right. Although it is said that having the Balhazia virus did hold him back in his early years, yeah. isn't it? Uh, we could also look at examples in other sports, because I was reading an article recently comparing the contrasting early careers of Tiger Woods and Roger Federer. So Tiger Woods, at the age of 10 months, was already swinging a cut-down golf club. At the age of two, he was so talented with a golf club that he was on national television. And while still at the age of two, he won a golf competition for under 10s. I didn't actually know that before I read this article. On the other hand, Roger Federer was apparently so lacklustre in terms of his motivation for tennis and almost lacking talent in that sport that his mum, who's actually a tennis coach herself, refused to play with him because she got so frustrated at his inability to return the ball. <laughs> Despite that though, as we all now know, Federer went on to become one of, if not the greatest tennis player of all time. Yeah, and that article you're referring to is written by a chap called David Epstein, who wrote a book called Bounce, the Myth of Talent versus the Power of Practice, where if you put 10,000 hours of practice in on that sport, then you will be successful at it. Practice makes perfect, essentially, yeah, exactly. is what he is saying, wasn't it? Although he did, interestingly, also point out that of the athletes he studied over the years, more of them fall into the Federer category than in into the woods category, in that most successful athletes did a whole host of different sports at a young age and only specialised when they got a bit older, and that actually it can be detrimental to adult sporting performance to specialise at a young age because you risk burnout or at the very least lack of motivation. Mm. And I suppose Remco Evenepoel perfectly fits into that Federer category, doesn't he? Because until just over two years ago, he was playing football for the Anderlecht <laughs> youth squad. Yeah, I mean, I guess you have to have talent and genes, the saying goes, you can't turn a donkey into a racehorse. And I guess if you took two cyclists and you said do 10,000 hours of practice, then you're gonna get vastly different results, aren't you? Definitely. I've always looked at pro sports uh, as a bit like a pyramid in terms of the athletes that are competing. So take cycling, for example. At the top of the cycling pyramid, you've got riders with everything. They've got the genes and therefore the natural talent. They've got all the desire and motivation to push mm. themselves in training. They are extremely competitive. They've got tactical now, so they're good at bike handling and they're good at positioning themselves in the bunch. Then as you go down the pyramid on either side, you get riders that have got most of those assets, but not all of them. So take me for example, somewhere down on the left, I had decent bike handling, I would say. I was very good at positioning the bunch, and I had all of the motivation and desire to train in the world. I mean, not blowing your own trouble. No, not at all. Know. But what were you actually bad at then? Well, what I didn't have, Hank, was natural talent. I mean, obviously I had some natural talent. I was always slightly better than average, but not compared to some of the best riders in the sport. And that really hit home to me when I joined the Cervelo test team. Oh, Dan. <laughs> Just bear with me for a few moments here. So what I was most looking forward to when I joined that team was finally finding out the top pro secrets. I was very read up on the latest training methods, mm. scientific, etc., uh, through my time as a career, but I always felt like there must be some secrets held back, understandably, by the best riders and coaches in the world. However, when I got there, what I realised was that the likes of Torhushoff, the likes of Carl Sastre, if they just did 20 hours a week of steady state riding, they were always going to be way better than me because they were far, far more talented than I am. This is the time where I get my violin out. <laughs> yes, please do. You're not bring it in today. Oh, no, Dan. But no, totally. I, I've known riders with power that I would absolutely kill for. But when it came to racing, they didn't really have the tactical nows. I mean, they used up all their wattage in places you didn't really need to around the bunch. And when, when it came to the climb or it came to the finish straight, they well, couldn't use the wattage they had. Mm. So in conclusion then, are we going to say that the top cycling stars are kind of born, but they still need the motivation and desire? I mean, actually, yeah. David van der Poel is a prime example. I'm pretty sure that he works just as hard as his brother Matthew, younger, mm. but doesn't achieve anywhere near the right results. 
I have no doubt that he probably trained just as hard as Matthew. He just didn't inherit quite as good genes as yeah. Matthew did. But don't despair. Uh, you can still make it to a reasonable level of the sport with a slightly above average amount of talent and a huge amount of desire like me. And then you get to talk about cycling for the rest of your life for your career. Happy yeah. days. Right, let's talk you guys now. Have you seen anyone that's shown little way of talent and it's taken years to get to the top of their sport? If you have, then pop your stories in the comment section below. We would love to hear about them. It's time now for your weekly and GCN inspiration, which as you all know, is your chance to win one of three wiggle voucher amounts. If you get third place, you'll get 50 pounds of vouchers, second will get you 75 pounds, and the winner will get 100 pounds of wiggle vouchers to spend on anything you want on their online shop. And it's now open to both photos and videos. Yes, and um, we opened this up last week and we've got some amazing videos sent in. And we're gonna start off with third place from Johannes, who did send in a video. And his video is taken in Mallorca, a cat for mentor, a rather famous climb for us cyclists, isn't it? It is. Well, it's an out and back route, which mm. I don't normally like, but it is so stunningly beautiful, as you can see right now here on this video. Uh, he's oh. just been for 10 days bike packing from Lago de Garda to, in Italy to Barcelona, uh, arrived in Mallorca at Port d'Alcudia, and then did that ride. That is an amazing sunrise. Yeah, sunrise, not sunset. I was going to say, you've caught the golden hour, but wow, that just looks, looks incredible, doesn't it? Yeah. It makes me want to get out on the bike. It does sound a little bit windy, though, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, who's next? Uh, in second place, we have Peter uh, over. Oh, the Otra. Yeah, yes, I probably should have looked how to pronounce that. Uh, from Poland, uh, a weekend trip with friends. Again, it looks like a sunrise uh, shot to me, and that is an idyllic road right there. Again, we are very much suckers for sunrise. I have to say, I did pick these, and uh, I am an absolute sucker for that kind of lighting. I just think it looks amazing. It I mean, that looked like looks like something that should be on a painting. And the fact is that normally on those sorts of sunrises, it can be quite fresh out, can't it? But he's yeah. in shorts and shorts leaves there. Uh, so well done to you, Pete. Mm -hmm. uh, we will get the 75 pounds out to you as soon as we possibly can. But the winner of 100 pounds this week is... Novan. Uh, this is another video, and it's from Manado over in Indonesia. I've never uh, been in Indonesia. No, well, I actually have. I've done a tour of Indonesia, which was about nine days, but I remember very little of it. It was a long time ago now. Uh, he said this is a solo ride, and it's very hard to find a flat surface around those roads, but it looks absolutely oh. stunning. Maybe one to revisit sometime. Yeah, look at that. I mean, I, I, I'm i there. Yeah. Dan, you can send me out whenever you want, mate. Uh, right, don't forget to continue sending us your photos and videos ready for next week. Uh, you can use the hashtag GCN Inspiration on Instagram, but make sure that you also uh, upload them using the uploader, a link to which is in the description below. Hey everyone, you may have noticed that I'm not on Zwift today, I'm actually on holiday. And if you can really closely spot where I am, you know I'm in Cornwall. I am putting the final preparations in place for next week when I get back, and I'll be getting the Zwift Academy workouts done thick and fast. I'm going to aim for three to four each week. I'll give you plenty of notice on social media via mine and GCN's channels so that you know when to join in. I'm feeling good after my trips away in the last couple of weeks. Training's gone well. Two trips to altitude, Avoriaz and then Colorado, and it does work out. The first 25 minutes of today's ride, flat out, at, out the door after a fly up, and I averaged 376 watts, which I thought was pretty good for 25 minutes. Anyway, I'm feeling good and looking forward to putting it to the test next week. I'll keep you all up to date. See you soon. It's now time for cycling shorts. Cycling shorts now. Now we recently did a video on how to replace your car with a bike. Now here in the UK, it is quite difficult because we well, just don't have the infrastructure like the storage or the bike paths like other cities do, do we? No, uh, complete contrast actually mm. to the Netherlands where biking and commuting by bike is an everyday activity. Now they said that there's more bikes over in the Netherlands than there are people, mm. although that in itself can pose some problems and it can be quite hard to find a place to leave your bike when you end up at a train station, for example. However, Utrecht have come up with a big solution to this, quite literally. They have just unveiled what they say is the world's biggest multi-storey bike parking. Yeah, it's said to hold a staggering 12,500 bikes, and it's all part of the investment going into to, well, really enhance the infrastructure in the Netherlands. Mm, as if they haven't got a decent infrastructure yeah. already. Not all doom and gloom in the rest of the world, though. Take, for example, New York, uh, where uh, car parking in Central Park West has been replaced uh, along the road by a brand new bike path. Almost seems like they're trying to take a leaf out of Utrecht's book and become less known for being a gridlocked traffic system and more 
actively encouraging commuting by bike. Yeah, it's all a good thing, isn't it? Mm. Now, in other news, we did mention it at the top of the show, the world cycling speed record has been broken by a chap called Neil Campbell from Essex here in the UK. Now, he took his custom bike, a staggering 174.3 miles per hour, 280 kilometers per hour. I mean, it's, I can't even believe well, it's it. It's got to be frightening, hasn't it? It's pretty scary to go that speed in a car, oh, I would imagine. I don't think I've ever been that fast apart from an aircraft. Mm. Now, the bike that he did it on, as you said, was custom. It's valued at £15,000. And its design is based a little bit like a tandem one. It's got a mm. really long wheelbase that is stable at those sorts of speeds. They then take him up to speed by pulling him, essentially with a bungee cord, which they then release so that he's under his own power alone when he goes through that section where he's timed for that speed. Quite something. I hope they had a fast car as well. Well, they must have done. Yeah. Are you up for it, mate? Not really, no. In <laughs> fact, I don't think my e-bike motor would take me up to those sorts of speeds. I don't really want to be pulled up to it. <laughs> now, talking of e-bikes, actually, the Arctic Race Tour of Norway have started with, well, using electric cars as the sport vehicles. They started with 46 this year, and they reckon in three years' time, they're gonna have a fully supported race, all done by electric cars alone. Yeah, we've not seen many electric no, cars in the Peloton, have we? I think EF Education first had a couple of Teslas here mm. and there, but this, to me, is definitely a step in the right direction. I think it's the way the sport will go very soon. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's because, well, the batteries can't go mm. as far as maybe the race goes, but yeah, definitely signs of things to come. Now, we all love cycling custom kit, don't we? And Nigerian track team, well, they've had a lot of fun with their designing of their kit, haven't they? They have indeed. Mm. Check this out. Yeah. I mean, that gets my vote as the coolest kit of 2019 <laughs> cool. so far. And apparently, it was inspired uh, by the kit that the Nigerian football team used. Ah. Very nice indeed. Yeah. Uh, right, last week, you remember, we posed the question on the GCN show, why do some people hate cyclists? And we thought we'd read out a couple of the comments underneath that show that really hit the nail on the head. Uh, the first of those came in from Minuteman, who put, most cyclists drive cars. Most car drivers don't also ride bikes. That is why the hate is mostly one way, which is a very good point indeed. And there was also this one from Paul who said, I rarely have any problems with drivers, but I also try not to be a problem to drivers. Mutual respect is the key. Yeah, now on this same note though, Scotland police have taken to Twitter to explain some of those myths. And we did talk it, talk it through on last week's show, uh, explaining the one which, no pay, no say. I pay road tax, so should you. But that was the start of many tweets, wasn't it? Yeah, it turned out they were gonna do seven of these yeah. myth-busting tweets. Gonna read out a couple of the favorite ones. Uh, number five was cyclists should use cycle lanes and stay off the road. Uh, they're truth. There's no legal requirement for a cyclist to use one. The only legal requirement relates to drivers. When a cycle lane has a solid white line, vehicles must stay out of it during its time of operation. And then myth number three, so it's okay for cyclists to come right up Sorry, when I'm in traffic lights. Uh, true, it's called filtering. Cycling is a great way to beat the traffic, stay fit and help the environment. Back to British Cycling with another great video which they lead to. Yeah, it's good that, isn't it? Yeah, really I, good. I, like I how love they've done the that. fact that mm. Scotland police are promoting cycling and dispelling some myths yeah. that car drivers have. <laughs> now on racing news now, we, well, we didn't get the chance to put it in the show because it came in a little late, but Philip Gilbert has announced that he's leaving to Koenig Quickstep and he's joined joining rival Belgian squad Lotto Soudal on a three-year deal, which shows a lot of faith seeing as he's 37 years old. I thought that. Mm. I mean, he must be very pleased with yeah, his three-year deal at that age, yeah. but it is a lot of faith to put in someone that is probably at the very best on a plateau and probably yeah. going downhill. Uh, right, unfortunately, we are going to finish Cycling Shorts this week with some sad news in the world of cycling. Uh, last week at the age of 76, Felice Gimonde passed away. He was one of the legends of our sport. He was the second rider out of only seven, even to this point, to win all three Grand Tours in his career. He's going to be greatly missed. The Gazette dello Sport dedicated five of its first pages to him at the weekend, and the cycling world has basically lost one of its icons. Rest in peace, Felice. Yeah, a true legend. Giveaway time now. Uh, last week we were giving, well actually why don't you show us what yeah, we were I bring him in? giving away last week. Uh, courtesy of our friends over at Park Tools, there were four prizes on offer. Uh, two PCS 9.2 stands and two PCS 10.2 stands. 
uh, as Hank is modelling next to you right now. Uh, so the winners of the 9.2 are Jacob Sargent here in Great Britain and Krul Marek over in Poland. Uh, whilst the winners of the PCS 10.2 are Blake Longley and Kengo Hashimoto, Hashimoto should I say, uh, both over in the US. So very well done to you. We'll get them out as soon as we possibly can. Yeah, I'll box them up after the show, shall I? Yes, yeah, that's your next job. Uh, right, no more giveaways for you this week, but stay tuned because we will have another one very soon indeed. But whilst we're here, we're going to give you a quick promo to the GCN shop because the designers over there have been busy. They have indeed. They've come out with this design and it's women's fit and men's fit. And if you buy this jersey in the shop and you go and get the black bib shots too, you get a 10% discount. You do, yes, yeah, so head over to shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com if you'd like to take advantage of that. I can yeah, see this is the that. new Explore uh, edition of the GCN fan kit, yes. which looks lovely. Uh, and also we're going to talk quickly about GCN events, because we've got our last one of 2019 coming up this week, in fact. Hank Can't and wait. Ollie are heading out there tomorrow, actually, as you uh, watch this video. And if Avoriaz and Mallorca beforehand are anything to go by, it is going to be a lot of fun both on and off the bike, isn't it? It is indeed. I can't wait. We're going to miss you. Well, I'm going to miss being there, to be perfectly honest. Although that said, I feel like I'm still recovering from Avorius. <laughs> yeah, it looked like you had a good time, to be mm. fair, Dan. But the 2020 plans are still being finalised, but to be sure not to miss out, then why don't you sign up to the newsletter at gcnevents.co, and while you're at it, why don't you sign up, well, or give the events team a follow on Instagram at gcnevent. You might see some of our photos on there, yeah. if you're lucky. Or over on Facebook, actually, mm. facebook.com forward slash gcnevents. Yeah, we hope to see you guys on the events soon. It's now time for hack forward slash bodge. If you guys would like to get your photos submitted, then use the uploader, which is in the descriptions below. Yep, or you can use the hashtag GCNHack on Twitter, mm. Facebook, or Instagram. Now, before we get on to this week's hacks and bodges, uh, somebody wrote in with some definitions of what a hack and what a bodge is, because we're quite loose with it, really. I needed and that this. is pointed out quite a lot to us. We just go with the flow, really, don't we? And I needed this. I actually asked Sai, and he couldn't give me a good enough uh, description. No, I said we're a bit loose. Uh, but <laughs> Brian Messimer wrote in with this definition uh, Both hacks and bodges are meant to be improvements, are both innovative and custom to your bike. They are both modifications, Changes additions to the bike or equipment, which are derived from either of the following procedures. One, developing or installing home fabricated or self fabricated parts. Two, repurposing one or more existing items which are not originally cycling related to serve a cycling related purpose. Distinguishing hack from bodge a hack succeeds where a bodge fails because a hack, one, is executed in an aesthetically neat and pleasing fashion, and two, exhibits attention to detail and careful forethought. Three, demonstrates a superior sense of engineering ability. Four, fulfills the intended design purpose well. Five, successfully argues the case for its existence, i.e. the nature of its purpose is useful enough and sufficiently universal in nature to justify there being a manufactured product on the market, but there isn't. Wow. You got that? I've got that. I think that sums it up perfectly, but no doubt we'll forget in the <laughs> weeks to come. Right, who's first up this week? First up, we got Nick, and he's got a, well, he needed a way to carry his footwear because when he couldn't wear cycling shoes, around his backyard, 10 miles from home, then he needed some well, a different kind of footwear. So how could he travel with his footwear? Footwear being flip -flops. Yeah, he was going to someone else's backyard for a barbecue 10 miles away, wasn't he? So mm. he didn't want to wear his cycling shoes and clip a clapper all the way around there. So he took his flip flops, or thongs as you call them down in Australia. <laughs> I mean, they look dangerously, dangerously close to the spokes, if you ask yeah. me. Yeah. Now- I mean, could you not have just strapped them to the, the big box on top? Yeah, I think, I pr yeah. yeah. That's, I, mean, I that, think that's what I would do, that's what I would do, but I mean... If it doesn't work one. at the back, try it by the front wheel, see how yeah. that goes. <laughs> but that's a bodge, yeah, isn't I'd it? I'd say that's a bodge. Yeah. Uh, this one comes in from Jeffrey Patrick uh, over in New York. Uh, after being waylaid by the second round of pipes, my partner and I got caught uh, in the dark and rain. On the ride home, my front light strap broke, but luckily I always ride with tape. The uses of electrical tape is incredible, I think. Yeah. You always take some tape with you. I have mine wrapped around my mini pump. Do you? Yeah. Right. And then it's always it's not there. a euphemism, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's always good to take some tape with you. It's still a bodge, though, isn't it? But it got you home, so yeah. is it a hack? I don't know, I can't remember the definition already. <laughs> uh, so on the same lines, and still using electrical tape, is Frank. Uh, we went to riding in the Belgian Ardennes. Uh, upon arriving, we noticed we've gotten a bike mount for the Garmin, so we figured out this solution uh, would it be something for hack or bodge. Well, using it's another an bodge as well. Really, 
It's another oh, bod. Tube yeah. and okay. Yeah, inner tube right. and tape. So I can think you get some sort of uh, elasticity. Yeah, an additional piece of material yeah. on this hack for Bit slash suspension bodge. for the I'd still say it's a bodge, but at least you'll see his data through the ride. Yeah, I mean, no data, no ride. Well, there That's is that saying, in yeah. some people's books. I don't yeah. agree with them, but still. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we've got Andrew. He recently took part in a local event showcasing local cycling businesses. I needed a stand to display my stock and came up with this. Constructed from an old bike uh, maintenance stand when a front wheel attached at top using a rubber bung which was compressed by the, the wheel skewer to yeah. lock into position. Looks good there, doesn't it? Look at that! I'd say that's a hack, personally. For a cycle shop, that's, a, that's, that's amazing! Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a hack. I might do the same for my coats at home, but I probably won't be able to. Uh, this came in from Emily in the Outer Hebrides. Too many bananas for your jersey to handle, just strap them to your bike. Uh, Emily used her wrist straps uh, that's used for her weak wrists and attached the bananas to the top tube via that. Although be careful with your wrists. She sacrifices her wrists for her bananas. Yeah, yeah. I don't just know if I would do that. There, Emily. Yeah. Uh, you could just use some tape if you wanted. <laughs> Uh, right, and then we had this in from Nigel uh, and in his pain cave. Uh, needed more space around the desk area in his office studio pain cave and came up with an ingenious way of holding the laptop on the trainer while Zwifting. Uh, a bit of plywood, some nails, a couple of screws, a bit of Velcro and a hairband pinched from his daughter and voila! Well, it's not just a laptop stand, is it? It's a phone stand too. I mean, that is that is pure genius and carpentry is his best. Mm. I mean, look at that, that is amazing, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that would save you quite this a lot This is also the Zwifting most ideal point to power up because you've got your phone right there to power up. Yeah. Make, makes life so much easier. Yeah, I'd say that's a hack. Person. It's a hack for me. Uh, finally, I think, is this one from Usman in Berlin. During the lunch hour, I saw this remarkable installation to get another passenger on board. Uh, we had something not too dissimilar last week, didn't we? But once again, I noticed that on the forks there's some little pegs for the feet to sit. In fact, it was two weeks ago because Opie was telling a story about how he'd he put broken his, his daughter's, his daughter's foot. foot. Yeah, oh, man. It, was, it wasn't a good story, that. Could we get one of those on your bike, mate, and then you can... Take me to work and back. You want to sit on the front? Yeah. Okay, we'll do it. <laughs> All right, don't forget to keep submitting your hacks and bodges ready for next week's show, which will be in front of a live audience in Salback with Hank and Ollie. Oh, it's going to be good. It's caption competition now, which is, of course, your weekly chance to get your hands on a GCN Camelback water bottle. We give you a photo, you give us your captions, and we pick a winner each and every week. Just to warn you, uh, both for the winner of this week and for next week's caption photo, uh, we're going to sing, aren't we? If you'd like we're, to turn the sound down now. Try. Uh, last week's photo came from the European Championships. This is under 23 champion Letizia Paternoster, and we've come up with a winner. Yeah, after a lot of great captions under there, the winner is Muddy Wheels with this caption. Are you ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. For oh, cheese a jolly good fellow. For cheese a jolly good fellow. For cheese a jolly good fellow. That's enough of that. Uh, well done to you, Muddy. Get in touch via message on Facebook with your address. We'll get that out to you very shortly indeed. Right, what's up this week, mate? Well, this week we've got a photo of the Bahrain Merida team on the podium, I think of the Bink Bank Tour. Uh, and we're going to sing this one as well. Three, two, one. We're singing in Bahrain. We're singing in Bahrain. What yeah, a one. Again, okay, that's enough of that, I think. Uh, you get the gist. Uh, let us know your captions in the comment section just down below, and we'll pick out some winners, or a winner, this time next week. Oh, that was a good one. Good one <laughs>Next up, it's your training related question answered by us. Uh, this is sponsored by our friends over at Zwift, which means that if we read your question out and answer it, you will also get yourselves not only some great, great coaching advice, but also three months of free subscription to Zwift. And that winner this week is Dean Madden, who sent in this question. I have a hill near my house that is about a quarter of a mile and has a step in it, where the hill is steepest at the bottom, then slightly flattens, then gets steep again to the top. My problem is that I can't maintain a good pace on the bottom that I could maintain to the top. But as soon as I get to the flattish part and the work load decreases, I blow up and then it's a struggle to the top. My question is, is the normal for this type? Is this normal for this type of short climb? And how or what could I do to prevent blowing up? as soon as it gets easier. 
Well, uh, this is something that is very common amongst all cyclists, especially mm. when they first start out. You get excited at the foot of a yeah. steep climb like that, don't you? It is a really short one, a quarter of a mile. What's that? Around 400 meters in length. So it's definitely, whatever your level, going to be an anaerobic effort. Mm. But despite that, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to pace things because that appears to be your problem there at the moment. Get too excited on the first short steep bit, go really into the red. And even though you'll get a slight bit of recovery on the middle flatter section, it's going to be a long hard uh, toil, isn't it, up to mm. the top on the last steep section. So what I would suggest, if you've got a power meter, is timing how long first it takes you to get up that climb, measuring what your average power output is, and then making sure that you don't go above the average on the first steep part of the climb. If you do that, you should get to the first flat bit relatively fresh, not completely fresh, but it will leave you enough to power over the top of the climb, which always leaves you feeling a lot better, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. The other thing that you should have a look at is your cadence. You can easily on the steeper climbs get lumbered down with a really big gear that you're churning around, which doesn't really enable you to respond to the gradients once it kicks in again. So make sure you're spinning on that flat section and ready to move up the gears when you get to the last steep section to the top. I uh, wish you the best of luck with training for that and let us know how you get on, uh, maybe in the comments underneath a GCN show in the future. Right, don't forget to get your questions in. You've got to use the hashtag AskGCNTraining in the comment section just down below this video. I'm going to tell you what's coming up on the channel over the next seven days now. Uh, so coming up on Wednesday, uh, we have got a commuter challenge with Opie and Hank here. What's faster, off the road or on? Thursday, we're going to give you seven outsiders to watch at the Vuelta Espana. Basically, seven young guns who we think could upset the apple cart with the more established professional stars. And on Friday, we have five essential gravel riding skills with Jay Powell. Yeah, on Saturday, I take on a recumbent bike. And on Sunday... Did you win? That sounds like a fight. Yeah, well, it, well, it, it was. You'll have to watch it and see. On Sunday, uh, Cy took on the Steamboat Gravel Race. Uh, on Monday, we've got the racing news show. And on Tuesday, it's back in here. Yeah. It's the GCN show where, are we doing it live? Uh, yes, well, it mm. will be you and Ollie in front of a live audience over in South. I'm nervous Park, for that one, actually. I can feel clammy hands already. Yeah, you should be, mate. I can see you sweating already. Uh, also, over on GCN Racing, we've got a whole load of live racing and highlights coming for you over the next week, or four weeks, mm. in fact. Uh, starting on Thursday, we have both the Ladies Tour of Norway and the Tour of Colorado, which is also a ladies' race only this year, available in most territories around the world. Uh, but available worldwide starting on Saturday, we've got daily highlights of the Vuelta a España, which we'll have for the entire three weeks which we are very excited indeed about. So yeah. if you haven't already headed over there and make sure you subscribe and also click on the bell icon because then you'll get a notification every time we put a video up. It's now time for Extreme Corner. Now this one comes in from Whistler where Martin Ashton and Blake took on one of the hardest downhill routes in Whistler. Check this out. Boom. Go Blake. Ready? Go. Oh, that was on the point then, dude. Remember this corner? Yeah. Go quite high. Quite oh, high, Mark. You I lie. couldn't because of the fusion. The reckon. Right, no brakes, brake. no brakes. Yes, no brakes. Oh, no. That was Try arse. Try go straight, Mark. I am. That's, my, that's me trying to correct. I have to say, mate. That is insane. I can't believe they took a tandem down there. I don't think I could take a normal mountain bike down there. No, no, I think I'd be quite scared on the back of Marty's tandem, <laughs> knowing how reckless he can be on a bike. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we hope you've enjoyed this week's GCN show. If you have, please click on the thumbs up icon, which you'll be able to find just down below. And if you'd like to see some more content right here on GCN, the racing new show, which is now over on the GCN Racing channel, is there for you. Well, it's just here. Just down.